All right, everybody, welcome back to the Get It Done podcast. I'm Joe Zanka, your host, co-founder, COO of On Demand Storage. And today I'm with my guest, Tim Hellenthal of National Van Lines. Tim, how are you? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you on. I always love to have a, um, a big presence in the, in the moving industry on to talk about, you know, uh, the background, you know, how you got here, and then, you know, obviously discuss a little bit about what we're seeing right now, which um, is a little bit of a little bit of chaos, but, you know, um, just talking through how, how people are handling that. So usually I think the best way to start off is, you know, we'll touch a, uh, we can get into national van lines and what you guys are focused on, but why don't you tell us about yourself and, um, and how you got into the position that you're in today? Walk me through your career a little bit. Sure. So, you know, I grew up in a small town farm country, Illinois. Um, my dad was a minister. Uh, we moved around a lot. We never hired a professional mover. Uh, you know, we were in the small towns where when you were moving, uh, you know, everybody showed up with their pickup truck and we'd have a pile you know, afterwards. Um, so I didn't know anything about the moving industry. Um, when I graduated from college, there really weren't any jobs for me in those, in those little small towns. And so I kind of moved up to the Chicago area with some of my buddies uh, looking for an opportunity. And um, I answered an ad in the newspaper and came to work for National Forwarding Company, which is our, our subsidiary that handles all the things for the Department of Defense as um, their TQAP administrator. And that was the old quality assurance program that uh, uh, the DOD ran. And uh, so I started there and I was working within the claims department and uh, we were growing, a lot of good opportunities. I was lucky I ended up at a company that um, had core values that match my own core values. Uh, you know, it's, you know, honesty, integrity, uh, you know, doing what we say, paying our bills, uh, treating people fairly. You know, I could have ended up at a lot of different places. I really feel fortunate that I ended up here. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of grew with the company, a uh, couple of promotions. And then in 2013, or actually I should go to 2011, Maureen Beal, we were a third generation family owned company. Uh, Maureen Beal was our uh, CEO. Uh, she was the uh, grand, granddaughter of the founder. And uh, she was ready for retirement and succession plan. And uh, she didn't want to sell the company to somebody that was going to come in and maybe break it up or let half the people go and take what's good and take all the assets and you know roll them into what they're doing. Uh, she wanted to protect the people that um, built the company and what it was. So she turned this into a 100% employee-owned company. Wow, um, which is really it's a, a it's a it's a cool bit it's a cool opportunity to run a business that's an employee-owned company. Sure. Um, and then she, after that, then the next thing was she named me as her successor. And uh, then she retired at the end of 2020. And then, you know, 60 days later, we had a pandemic. So she uh, was pretty smart to, uh, to uh, <laughs> walk away at that time. Almost like she foresaw it coming or something. <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a cool story because there's a lot of different ways that, you know, and I, I talked to a lot of movers, I have them on my show and a lot of different ways that people find themselves getting into this industry. And, and like you touched upon, some of it's, it's like, you know, these third generation family owned businesses that have been around for a while, passed down, down, down. In other ways, it's just people stumble upon it, which it seems like, um, you know, that, that was kind of the, the path that you ended up taking. But inevitably, um, like you said, you know, if the, if the company matches your core integrity, you, you know, your core values, and, and, and you find, you know, that you can provide value where you are and, and, and really learn to grow the company, then, um, you know, obviously it makes sense to, to be in a position that you are today. It, yeah, it's a super cool business. I, I mean, what, I, what I've enjoyed about it the whole time and really from the start is that, you know, when my phone rings, it can be anyone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. really legitimately, you know, we're moving on the military side, you know, we're moving colonels and generals and important people uh, to work for the Department of Defense on the civilian side. Died, you know, there's uh, a lot of vice presidents, lawyers, stars, people that were moving, uh, business owners. Uh, we've got drivers, packers, uh, movers that I'm talking to. So, you know, it's always, you know, it's, it's a variety of people and that's uh, really keeps it interesting. Oh, for sure. No, and that, that is exciting. And that um, it's good to know that, you know, people of that caliber are, are the, you know, entrusting your company with, with their personal items, you know, that, that uh, has to be an honor. It's an honor and a uh, and a responsibility that you have right. to gain for sure. But you know, it's also good that you have the wherewithal and the you know the the confidence that um, your company 
you know, so reputable and has the systems in order to fulfill jobs like that. You know, my company's pretty, pretty small and hasn't been around quite as long. And, um, you know, if, if, if a, v, a vice president or someone was like that, would have called me, you know, I would be a little bit uh, intimidated, but it seems like you guys, you know, kind of are, are looking for those exact opportunities, trying to get, um, and, and just do those bigger business, you know, take on those biggest, bigger, bigger business opportunities and be the go-to guys within the industry to fulfill these types of things. Right. Yeah. And when you think about it, those are the people that have, I mean, you know, moving is not cheap. Moving interstate, you know, long distance, it's not cheap when you, you know, all the different things you have to do. So um, the folks that are able to move, those are typically that are able to afford to move. Those are the kinds of people that we're moving a lot of, you know, kind of high touch customers to have uh, high expectations. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, to talk to what are you guys like primarily focusing on this time of year you know obviously we're just getting into the summer and um and you know forget about for a second like all the all the craziness that's going on in the world um you know what's national van lines primary focus how do you guys you know what are you advertising um and, and who are you doing business with primarily right so um it's a challenging time for us and you know, it's June. We just have a ton of people moving. We've had incredible demand over the last, really since the end of the pandemic, uh, the COD uh, long distance um, uh, business has just skyrocketed. And we can we attribute it to a few different things. There's part of it that's, um, you know, pandemic driven. People are moving to where they wanna be, uh, closer to family is what some of our, our research has indicated. Um, but there's just so many people moving right now. So we're just trying to make sure that we're taking care of all those different customers that we have. Um, and it's really, it's hard to do in the, under current conditions because as everyone knows, and probably anybody that's in the moving industry that's been on your, on your uh, show here, driver shortage has been going on since I got in this industry 27 years ago, right? You know, that's always been the discussion, driver shortage, driver shortage. And we've seen it change over time from, uh, you know, as, as pods has, has come around, all the different kinds of pack rat, all the different kinds of containers and do-it-yourself and uh, containerized shipments. So we've kind of got away from moving as much on our drivers, but now we're also running into the labor issues where I feel like labor is really um, getting more and more scarce. So I think we're um, really just trying to focus on making sure that we, we're, we're able to move the folks that we've committed to move. So the other things we're doing is we're analyzing data right now to see what we have in the sales funnel. So we can look into our, um, our sales platform, which is built on Salesforce. And we can see, you know, the estimates that are in there going forward, you know, into as far as we have estimates. And we can see what's coming in July and August and what's out there. And then we can um, adjust the accelerator, um, maybe take our foot off of it a little bit uh, through various pricing decisions, through, you know, maybe adding some spread dates, um, you know, to give us a little longer to get shipments there uh, when we see we're at high demand, um, doing different kinds of things like that. So um, we're really we're analyzing the data to make sure that we're not over committing ourselves. And then on the, the operations piece of it, you know, we're throwing our resources uh, behind trying to make sure that we're uh, providing a good quality service to everybody that's uh, selected nationally. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of challenges going on right now. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. Like you mentioned, there's kind of always been a driver shortage, but then when the it, it's when the labor shortage is matching up to pent up demand, you know, that's when it gets to be um, a little bit crazy. You know, your phone's blowing up off the hook and, and you don't have enough resources to go fulfill some of these jobs, which maybe in the past, you know, you might have. And we touched upon this a little bit beforehand, like were you guys ever a company that you know would take would take advantage of the overseas workers prior to? Um, no, we we never did that directly ourselves, but I know quite a few agents that did that. You know, it's a shame that, that program has been uh, halted because I think it's a great opportunity for uh, the workers themselves and for the companies. Uh, yeah, and so uh, you know we're members of ATA, and actually that was one of the things I was brought up to uh, to our rep there. Uh, saying you know the asking because the, the dod on the other hand i'm also really involved with the dod business part of it as well and the dod right now is um, their demand is really high they're kind of uh, you know in hair on fire mode they're not able to get their shipments booked 
Uh, so they've got military customers that need to do a, a permanent change of station move to go to their new duty location. And when they go and try to book those shipments, like we have an opportunity to black out and say, look, we can't take any more. We're taking all we want to take. Um, they can't get their customers through. Uh, so they're running around crazy. Going, well, what else can we do? What else can you do as an industry? And it's like, well, maybe we can get the DOD behind pushing for that program so we can help get some additional workers in here, some labor, because that's really what we're going into. There's not enough capacity. Agents are reporting to us all over the country uh, that as they went back and tried to build their crews back, they're, they can't do it. Um, they're, you know, the, the number that's been uh, bandied about, and I don't know how much it's anecdotal versus actual, someone did uh, actually did a study on it, but that most, most agents are running around 75% what their normal pre-pandemic capacity was. Um, you know, so if you're running, uh, you know, four, you were running four crews, maybe now you're only able to run three crews. Wow. Uh, so that's, it's had, that has a dramatic impact. And, you know, it we, does. We can get some help. Um, and, and that way, that would be uh, you know, the other thing that would always help us that we always talk about is, you know, smoothing out that demand signal. Uh, Department of Defense, you know, like everyone else, they want to move their people or their people want to move when the kids aren't in school. And so, you know, it's, you know, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, you know, and then it goes back down. And so it's really hard for uh, business owners to keep their crews busy. So anywhere we can flatten that out, that helps down, uh, put a little predictability into your business. So it's, uh, you know, if we can get that, that needs a program, that would be really helpful for the industry. It would be, yeah. No, I mean, the ATA, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of that organization too. And I get updates, you know, on a daily basis with emails. It seems like, you know, they're, they're pushing for, um, you know, hopefully some of these changes, you know, they're really vouching, you know, they, do, do, they do a really good job vouching for the industry and, and making yeah. sure that, you know, we're put, um, you know, the, the moving industry is put first and, or just considered in, 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 in these topics that you and I are discussing right now are, are hopefully trying to be pushed to the forefront because they do matter. You know what I mean? There's, um, you know, it, it's a, when you think about it, just like the entire economy too, I mean, that's being affected, like, like you mentioned, School's getting out a little bit later than normal, I think, this year. And now all of these people are looking to move right when, like, you know, hey, school's out. Let's, let's make the jump. You know, we only have two months until school starts back up again. So right. they, um, and, and then that combined with the labor shortage, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting summer. You know, I think it's going to be like you mentioned even before the show, your moving's already tough. And now right. um, these constraints are 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 making it even more challenging on everybody right. physically demanding i mean like you're saying you know they're running at 75 percent of what they might normally do but they might even be running with like 60 percent of the people so those you know those individuals are being worked extra hard they're getting burnt out i mean this is a physically demanding absolutely business that that operates traditionally in the hottest times of the year right. <laughs> the most so it's right it, there's it's a lot going on here it's a hard job. I mean, that's the thing. It's hard for in, in every aspect of it. And, you know, hats off to our professional band operators uh, that are out there running the road and um, all the crews that are helping load and unload and pack. I mean, it's a, it's a tough job. And I think the other part of it, too, for us is that on the civilian side, the COD side of the business, we, they, those crews have been running hard since last July. You know, that's when business really bounced back, at least for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, no one's had that breather. I know our, my operations department, you know, they've been going full bore for six, six, eight months. And now we're in probably the most demanding peak season that I've ever seen. Um, you know, people are only capable of doing so much and they need time to, you know, take a breath. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a real challenge to try to manage that. No, absolutely. So, uh... Where do you kind of see all this shaking out? You know, we talk maybe like we think about like a three, five year timeline. Um, you know, let's say obviously nothing like the pandemic happens, you know, again to, to totally right. disrupt the whole world. Right. Um, you know, how do you see this like affecting the moving industry and like the the obviously we're talking short term right now, maybe like the longer term, you know, three to five years. What do you think that might look like? Right. Um, so I, I love the question. Um the idea of the pandemic, I mean, something I talk about is that 
first of all, it's like the pandemic is kind of over in a lot of people's minds, which I think it generally is, but there's some probability there could be another pandemic next year, right? I mean, there's some probability of that happening. Who knows? Well, but it's possible. Um, then the second part of it is that the whole idea about prediction, right? So I'm one of these people, I, I rely a lot on data. Um, but I also know that humans are notoriously bad about prediction. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for patterns where there aren't patterns, but we're, our minds are telling us there's a pattern there. So we're looking in the wrong place sometimes. So I, I'm usually hesitant to make predictions. Yeah. Uh, but I like to throw them out there because I give my little caveat so that if I'm wrong, then I can say, well, I said, you know, predictions are <laughs> predictions. If I'm right, I can go, look how smart I was when I made that <laughs> prediction. So, yeah, we got it on camera now. Right. It's all about covering yourself, you know, playing both sides of it. Um, I mean, we're going to just keep seeing the move towards, um, you know, more containerization or, uh, you know, uh, either in kind of the lip band model, uh, which is the model that we prefer to have relied on because as an agent, all you need is a uh, forklift to be able to handle those shipments. Um, you know, all those other uh, specialized kinds of containerization required you agents to buy special equipment, you know, it could be a 30, 50, $70,000 investment. Agents don't really have that much money to put into it, a lot of them. And then you have the problem matching stuff up on each end. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to continue to see more containerization. Um, I'd like to see the industry somehow come up with some idea or at least some parts of the industry have talked about this yesterday, you know, how can we solve our labor issue? Um, I think that's something we need to look at. Um, as you know, is there a consortium that we can put together? You know, some of the van lines or some of the more independent, uh, legitimate movers, you know, that I call them. Uh, you know, how can we figure this piece out where we can get reliable labor that's well trained, uh, pay them well, pay them what they're worth? Because I think that's uh, you know one of the things that's giving them a little bit of power right now. And you know, they're like, hey, you guys, as an industry, 20 years ago. Um, you know, if you go back 40 years ago, all the agents had labor that were employees. You know, we went more and more to this independent contractor model. I think this is the, the result. Um, I think those agents out there that have employees, they pay more, it costs more. We, they can charge more, uh, but they have a, a more reliable set of uh, um, a re more reliable service level. They sure. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I think agents that can, um, can kind of inoculate themselves from some of the crazy demands of, um, you know, trying to find guys and trying to get help in some of these oddball areas and, and do that by having, um, by having a well-trained well -trained staff. So if we can see, we're going to see more containerization because there's just not that many drivers that are coming up to become long distance drivers. And, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt in my mind, that's the hardest job of all. In the movie industry. Yeah. I mean, yep. I look at these guys and what they do from a professional standpoint. It's, it's staggering to think that they're doing it away from their home all the time. And I know. It's just, you know, to have that routines and kind of big routines and habits guy. Like, you know, like my habits, I go to bed at a certain time, get up at a certain time, or try to have that. But I also travel to work. A lot when you know when not when there's conferences going on I'm on, I'm on the conference circuit doing all that that all that kind of travel messes with your habits and we've got you know our primary business providers are out there they're, they're constantly traveling right yep. so that's that's an incredibly challenging physical job and it's also hard on your mental thing um so you know trying to get guys into be drivers i i just don't think they're going to pull a lot of you know I don't think there's any magic pill that the industry can come up with. It's like, oh, wow, we've got all these new drivers coming up and we solved this driver shortage uh, issue. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think that's uh, possible. So it's, you know, how do we utilize or how do we leverage those guys that we have who are the best movers? Right? Those guys that are professional van operators, our drivers, I think, are, and I'll speak firsthand knowledge, you know, we, we score all of our drivers and on our military side of the business, we work with drivers from all the band lines, all the independents, you know, we're interlining a bunch of that traffic. There's just, you know, so I can see how other band lines stack up and then how other independents stack up. Our drivers are, are the best out there. Um, how can we leverage those guys 
to help us do more business. Yep. You know, I, I don't have that answer, but it's, no. you know, it's something we're talking about working on, trying to figure out how to take that experience and knowledge and skill and, um, and you know, what's the force multiplier. Yeah. This seems so futuristic, but it's not because they're already seeing it kind of come, you know, to the forefront, but like, what about like autonomous vehicles? Like, is that something that people are actually talking about? Like autonomous trucks? Because right. who so, knows, you know? Right. So I've been talking about that for a while. Um, I'm not sure where it's going to land. And this is another one of those, you know, predict the future moments. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity to talk to the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Movers Conference a couple of years ago. And they asked me, like, I said, well, what, what would you like me to talk about? And they said, well, talk about the future of the moving business. So at an hour, I spent the first half an hour telling them why predictions are terrible. Um, and then the next half, we were talking about, you know, where are we going with autonomous trucks? And I, you know, honestly, I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm 52 within my career that it would be ubiquitous within the moving industry. I think we'll start seeing some of it maybe towards the late end of it. I still think they have a long ways to go. Um, but it's coming and we have to figure out as an industry, as a company, how can we fit into the puzzle so that we can be a part of that, so we can take advantage of that through. So like if, if somebody delivered a bunch of autonomous vehicles tomorrow here to drive, I still need somebody to load them. Yeah. I, and then, you know, I would, I would look to my, our, you know, professional van operators. Like, you know, we still need someone to operate the van. Right? Mm -hmm. We need somebody to operate that, to run the crews, to, you know, make sure it's properly inventory protected for transit, all those other things. Um, so it's coming. I think we'll get to the point where my, my prediction on that was that eventually we'll have power units and then we'll have various size containers, right? So they can be 10, 20, 40 foot containers, like in Dopa, something similar to like a, a, an overseas van. Um, we'll take it, that power unit, we'll take it to the residence using, you know, we'll punch in an address and it will take it to the residence. But once it gets to the residence, we're, we're going to have to have a driver position that, that uh, container for loading, right? So you're going to have drone operators, basically, that are your actual drivers. And so they can position that you know, I can see them sitting at a, at a desk with, you know, three monitors and they, you know, you're going to have cameras on the unit so you can see where to position it. Because once you get to a home, I think that's the hard thing about bringing autonomous vehicles into us. It's not a highway. You know, there's, right. there's power lines, there's trees, there's a car parked here that wasn't yesterday. So yeah, oh yeah. Eyes on it. You know, we're, we're you know, to get to the point where they can program in that specific capability. I mean, I think that's like, 50 years in the future. I don't think we're very close to that yet. It's got a, it's the thought of that, you know, backing in a, a, you know, 26 foot vehicle into a, into a driveway, you know, because every driveway is, you know, custom, like every, every individual right. house is just a custom thing. So, well, you know, it's, you look at the driveway too and you go, okay, it, you know, there's a front door and a back door, which is the easiest way that you're going to unload most of the furniture into or from the house. So that, you know, are you going to park the unit on the left side or the right side of the driveway? For, you know, like humans can look at that and immediately make a decision. Yeah. Uh, you know, getting that program down to that detail uh, for a computer, I think, for a long place from that. But of course, there could be some watershed event in programming. You know, there's this idea of quantum computing that's out there that uh, can change everything potentially. And maybe they could, you know, come up with it 10 years. So that's the, the risk of prediction, right? <laughs> Well, um, well, I appreciate you, you know, giving your insight into that. I think it's extremely interesting. And I think um, that, that was just one thing that came to mind when you're talking about the driver shortage, like, you know, maybe where is that? But when you actually start to think about all the capabilities that that, that truck would need, um, yeah, you're, you, you know, you're probably right. It's like, how can they, pro you know, it's one thing to be on a highway. It's another thing to actually get into the neighborhood and, and do all the things that we just talked about. So yeah, I think um, from a standpoint of a, of a young guy that's come, what, that would want to come to this industry, I don't think he has any, you know, if he has a fear of like an autonomous truck taking his job at some point, I don't think he should have any fear at all. Because yeah. what will happen is even if someone can drive a long distance, we're still going to need all those other skills. Yep. That those professional van operators have. 
Yeah. I know it's almost like it would need to drive, you know, like if a, if a something's going from Boston to Arizona, you know, that the, you could load the truck and it could get to like a point in Arizona, but then it would need a, an individual to meet it there. And right. it, it's like a final, final mile idea, right? Yeah. Like a final mile labor type of idea. And you're still going to need somebody to uh, load the furniture. The, the phrase I like to say is the computer <laughs> can't carry a couch, right? I mean, no. that's, and that's a lot, that's, that's even farther off in the future. You know, I believe that someday they could probably make it happen, but you know, that's probably not in my kid's life. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a long way away. I agree. Um, so Tim, what, what are some things that, you know, outside of the moving industry, when you're not, you know, swamped behind the desk, what are some things that you like to do outside of, outside of, uh, work, any interests, hobbies? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader. Um, well, that's going to be my next question is for a book recommendation, but we'll get to that later. I've got a ton of book recommendations. I, I feel like I'm the guy that whenever you talk to me, I'm like, hey, I've got a book you should read. You know, everybody's like, oh, give me more homework, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm an avid reader. Um, I try to get up every morning and uh, I, I'm an early riser. I get up and have uh, half an hour of reading, um, you know, and work out either do like taking up yoga in the last 18 months, which yeah. is fantastic. I, I feel great. I run every other day. Um, I like being outside. So I'm an outside person. If I'm, you know, I, I spend much time indoors. Um, so, you know, those are, you know, I like to cook. Yep. Uh, always trying to sling hash and uh, come up with something new to make. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm always in the kitchen. I really enjoy doing that. Yep. Yep. But uh, that's one of those things. I would never start a restaurant, though. That, that's, uh, I wouldn't want to cook for pay. I want to cook for fun because I enjoy eating good quality, you know, fresh food, that kind of thing. So, so. Yeah, I'm with you on the starting the restaurant thing. I mean, the moving industry is hard enough. I think that one is even even a little bit crazier <laughs> with all the ins yeah. and outs and expirations and just like the staff. Yeah, I just think, yeah, I think it would take all the fun out of it. Now, I would enjoy, I, I do think I would enjoy running a successful restaurant. Yeah, or owning maybe a piece of one. <laughs> Taking hands, kissing babies, you know, doing that front of the house kind of thing, jump in the kitchen occasionally. But uh, but I think that day to day grind of being a chef is uh, you know, that would be working in the kitchen. That's hard work. It definitely is. And well, I appreciate you know you, you getting into it too, because I think you mentioned you know earlier in the conversation you're you know routine guy. And I, I think that if you can get in yourself into those habits that you've seemed to build for yourself where you you know get up early read, get the brain going, work out, get the body going. It's like, now you're prepared for the day. And it's, you know, it's tough to just roll out of bed and, and jump into, uh, especially a role like yours, you know, you're, you're, you're leading in a, a big organization. Um, so you, you got to get that stuff going early and, and you just I, I, roll it's out of bed. A good idea, right. You know, so I, I, I try to fill up my bucket every morning because I know that I'm going to have to make decisions every day. There's going to be demands of my time for different things. All those little things take a little bit out of my pocket, right? You know, and kind of when your pocket gets empty, you need to re refill it. So for me, that's good night's sleep is the number one most important thing you can do for your health. Um, you know, I've read quite a bit about all the different things you can do, exercise and, you know, eating right. Those are all important too. But, uh, but I think the, the consensus is, is getting a good night's sleep. So that means you need to get on a good sleep pattern. Um, and so if I can do those things in the morning, my bucket's full when I hit the door here uh, and I'm ready for the day and I have the energy that I need to do what I need to get done here. It's great. It's great. No, and I've read, I've read very similar things. I listen to podcasts all the time talking about sleep and I think it's, uh, yeah. it's people are making some big time realizations in like how important that is. You know, I, I think uh, for a while there, you know, you'd get advice or you'd listen to these things from, you know, highly successful people and, and right. they talk about how, you know, you, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know what I mean? Or I'll sleep, you know, it's, I, I run on four hours or, you know, you burn the uh, midnight oil, but um, when you actually break down the science, you're, you're hundred percent correct. You need, your body needs to do it and you, you need to give it that. And so whether it's like, you know, you're a morning person and, and you got to go to bed early or, you know, you're someone who stays up till midnight, you got to give yourself that time to rest. You really yeah. do in the long run, it's going to, matter so much absolutely it will absolutely pay off because i mean there's again there's just so much scientific evidence out there about the impacts the effects of lack of sleep you know like one study was that you know if you get less than five hours a night five hours a night 
two weeks, you, like your your cognitive ability is basically like you're drunk, you know, like you know, and that's not a good way to run a business. If you're drunk. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sure, no. some people do it successfully in that way. But, <laughs> um, that wouldn't be a, a good way for me to do it. No. So. Lastly, we'll, we'll touch upon that, uh, that that book recommendation. Usually I ask for you know one book recommendation, whether it's something you read recently, something you read throughout your career that um, that you would give to the audience, anything that comes to mind. Sure. So uh, a book I'm a big fan of is The Obstacle is the Way uh, by Ryan Holiday. Uh, it's a modern take on uh, the Stoic philosophy. Uh, so Stoicism has a um, connotation, you know, from Hollywood of like, an emotionalist person uh, but he lays it out in a very accessible way that really talks about what stoicism is and stoicism is you know it, it, at the heart of it is um, not letting your emotions get in, get in the way of your rationality right so and to expect I guess kind of expect the worst I, I think one of the good ways a way I like to talk about it is um, are you a fan of uh, everybody kind of does the, the Rocky movies, right? Yep, so, yep. So there's a scene in one of the movies where Rocky's talking to his kid. He's talking about uh, getting hit. And he goes, you know, it's not about getting, you know, it's about getting back up. And it gives us, you know, it's probably it's my it's my favorite part in all those movies. So yeah. It's not about, you know, how hard you how get hard you get it, how many times it's, you, yeah, it's yep. about how many times you can get back up. And I think that's exactly right. But I think kind of the stoic idea goes one step further and it says, look, a lot of this is out of your control. Like I control certain things in my life. Like usually I get control when I go to sleep, but there's a lot of things that are just out of my control. The pandemic is out of my control. So I, I add onto that idea that it's not only knowing that you're, when you get back up, not only getting back up, but it's knowing when you get back up that someone somewhere is going to knock you down again. Sure. And when you get back up, it's not always with this idea of like, oh, I've risen again. It's like, hey, I'm going to get knocked down again. I'm okay with that. You know, and just having that, it's that kind of resilience. It's that kind of growth. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what I try to build into my life. Not that successful at it, but I'm always trying it, right? You know, it's, it's, that's the mindset. That's the direction. I think that book um, really does a good job of capturing it. Talks about some real great examples that are modern and uh, accessible. Uh, talks about University of Alabama football team. You know yep. those kinds of things that you can that you can relate to. Um, so I think that that's a great book. And then the other one, just for fun, I'll, I'll do two book recommendations. I just finished uh, the book Bomber Mafia by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh wow! Yeah. And it's talk. He talks in that about. In World War II, and I know a lot of guys, you know, are like World War II, like well, anything will read it, you know. Um, but it's the kind of the debate within what was then the Army Air, they weren't the Air Force yet, but they were under the Army. But it was precision bombing. You know, there was a group that said, hey, look, if we can just take out the water treatment plant and the ball bearing plant, then we can bring this war to an end with you know, minimal casualties. And then the other group that said, no, you, we're just not that good at it yet. We just need to like win, right? So win at all costs, uh, you know, kind of that, I don't think they use the phrase carpet on if there's a few other, but, but there's the part of that, of the, of the side of that. And there's really two kind of protagonists in this that are representing each camp. Yep. Um, and how in World War II, we weren't ready for that precision bomb, right? Like we had these, um, ways to try to bomb, but there was all these variables and the, the, you know, the science, the technology just wasn't that good to really get it done. And then what we did, you know, with Japan and how, you know, the guy who eventually uh, kind of led us into uh, Japan did really massive bombing raids, you know, one bombing raid in Tokyo, there was uh, the first one we did, there was like almost 100,000 people who died that day, right? So they, they say that's probably the number one you know, one night all time loss of life you know, in the history of the world. But his his point was, this gets the world faster. Mm -hmm. yep. It's terrible, but this otherwise you're just going to have perpetual war. Right. Uh, so it's a fascinating uh, walk down there, get down that, and then kind of see where we are now. If you look at where we are now, we're all in the precision bomb. 
right? If you think yep. about what we do, yep. it's, you know, hey, we bomb a target. We can take out a target. But now look at how long our wars are going on. I know. You know? I know. Homeless now, right? So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to read. It's super entertaining. It's a good story. And it's an easy read. So it's not, uh, it's not super heavy. I appreciate that. I like um, I like the, the the business book and then the the uh, the World War II book. I have to, I'll pick up anything or, or watch anything about you know World War II. I mean, there's so much you can just learn from those events. Is you know history like is just it's always um, it's always fascinating when you read about you know it, it, and then you like you mentioned what was going on then and compared to what's going on now and right. and um, and how you know it's evolved, but also how you know like you said at the time with the precision stuff, it was like, well, this will end the world faster, but now it's like, well, that's all we do, but it, right. wars, <laughs> wars are, they're, they're kind of perpetual. They, right. It's, it, it's wild. So I want to ask you if you can give me a book recommendation. Oh, well, a book recommendation, um, you know, something I've read recently, I like to read, um, I like to read autobiographies sometimes, you have people I'm interested in, um, yeah. And I don't know, you know, this one is a little bit cliche, but it just came out like pretty recently. So I read, um, you know, Matthew McConaughey's book called Green Lights. Um, and it's. I bought it from my mom for Mother's Day. So I haven't read it yet. But it's on oh, I thought it was fantastic. And, and um, you know, occasionally, obviously, the, I, I'm more of a fan of the paperback, you know, just having the, the, the book in hand. But he narrates his own version of it too on, on audio. So I was kind of doing like a double, you know, I mean, yeah. I'd read a little bit and then I'd listen to a little bit. And um, the way he tells these stories, man, he's had a fascinating life. And it's cool because he talks about, um, you know, the, the concept is green light. So it's like, you know, when life gives you like the, the term a green light is just like it is in the real world, like it's go. So right. there's a, there are point in times in your life where, you know, the, the universe will kind of give you that like, all right, you know, go ahead, like go. And so he touches upon all these little experiences that he has and, right. and, and, and you know, he goes and he does these notes to self throughout the whole book, like, you know, from the experience he's learning, he's just a, a fascinating guy, you know, way more than the guy on screen. And, Super. and the, the cool thing about him is that like, he went from being a, you know, very much like branded, you know, um, kind of romantic comedy actor, like nobody, right. you know, it was just like, Oh, this is the guy that takes his shirt off in the movies. Right. Too. Right. Right. But he, like he was making millions of dollars doing that. Like he could have kept doing that to the end of time. You know what I mean? And, and, and he would have been, he would have been fine, but he just one day said, I'm not doing that anymore. And so he took like a break from Hollywood. He was getting all these opportunities, millions of dollars. Agent was like, you're crazy. And he just said, no, I, the only way I'm going to get out of this and be able to do serious acting is if I just say no to everything. So he started saying no to everything. Long story short, he got into it. now. I don't know if you've seen much of his work lately, but some of the movies he's in, are, you know, very serious roles. Like, but he he crushed. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's like an incredible actor. So yeah, he's, that, in, he's in probably my favorite movie of all time, which is We Are Marshall. Yes, and, uh, yes. Coach in that, he's fabulous. In it, you know, and that was kind of I don't. That was probably one of his first movies where he kind of got like a real serious, you know, role. Yep. Yep. And he's been doing um like the True Detectives and the you know the the um. What's that one? Uh, the one with the, it was about the AIDS epidemic. Um, I'm trying to, oh, I'm blanking. The Dallas Buyers Club. Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable stuff. And so yeah, I love that book. I mean, he's a, he's a super fascinating guy, just like has a great perspective on life. And so that's one that I've picked up recently that had like a kind of an impact on me. And so yeah, I, I recommend that one. I'll definitely get it on my, uh, on my Audible. Yeah, the Audible version is great because he tells the story. So it's like that's, yeah, well, that's that. a cool thing now that you know you you read these. I did a, a Kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bourdain, uh, and he's just got such a unique voice. You know, the, <laughs> yeah. the way he tells a story and the way he talks, and like, uh, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a cool feature of uh, Absolutely, definitely, definitely. And the cooking. One last thing is, if you know, I don't know if you've heard of Masterclass. Um, those like that. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah, yeah, they have a lot of good. Um, you said you're into cooking. They have a lot of cool tutorials about like how to cook brisket, how to cook, you know, all these different things. So that's something that I think it's like twenty bucks a month. It might be a little bit more, but it, I, I like split it with like my brother and, we, and my dad, and like we just watched. But you can learn how to play chess yeah. on there. It's it's like yeah, there's some super cool stuff. I've avoided checking it out because I know that I'll like. Oh, well, I could do that too. You know, it's like just where can I fit it in? <laughs> well, yeah, we'll consume consume okay. a little bit too much of your time. But 
Um, yeah. It's something pretty cool. Like for the, from a cooking aspect, they have Franklin Barbecue, Wolfgang Koch. You know, they have Gordon Ramsay, all these guys teaching yeah. cooks. It's pretty cool. So, um, well, look, Tim, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, my pleasure. Appreciate you, you know, getting into the industry, you know, getting into the the, the depths of that, and then and just sharing a little bit about yourself. Um, it's been awesome. So it's been a pleasure to meet you. And uh, and thanks again. And I, I, I look forward to staying in touch. Absolutely. Glad, uh, glad to be on. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So you have a good day and we'll talk soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Joe.